this is our speaker for today, Dennis Oakley. He is the head of business model innovation, Dennis Oakley and Co. So yeah, I think uh, without further ado, I would happily pass this uh, stage to Johan and Dennis. So yeah, Johan, the stage is all yours. All right, all right. Hello again, everybody. Welcome. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever in the world you may be from. Today, we hope you're in the right session, okay? Today, we are talking about fail-proofing businesses with Dennis Oakley, okay? And this, this event, we're tying it uh, directly with our global startup grind theme for the month, which is related to Global Entrepreneurship Week. So we thought it'd be um, uh, prudent if we, we approach Global Entrepreneurship Week by thinking about what are the, what are the common factors to cause businesses to fail so that we can learn from them, right? And who better than a business model innovation expert like Dennis, right? So Dennis, before we get into the, the nitty gritty of everything, I think we should give everybody some context. Would you care to share a little bit about yourself in, in your own words? Um, what has your work life journey been like and how did you end up in um, the role that you're in now? All right, thank you. Thank you, Ern. Um Most people think that my, my journey has been a little bit strange. I mean, I, I think you, you go to university and you expect it's going to be a straight line of one success after an, another taking you to some predetermined uh, work heaven in the, in, in the sky. Um, I was talking to somebody the other day and uh, uh, discovered he was going to do chemical engineering in Bath. And it made me remember oh, I was going to go and do a degree in chemical engineering once. And <laughs> I actually got to Bristol University in the in the early 90s um, to do exactly that. But within a, a day or so, I'd, I'd, I'd switched to do um, a philosophy degree. And, and that led to me being virtually unemployable when I finished. Um, and, and so I scraped around doing some pretty, pretty terrible jobs. I, I never sexed chickens, but I did wine transformers al along the way. And I tell you, that was boring. And, and uh, for some reason, I ended up as a, as a railway engineer uh, designing high speed railways. That led to me working with the European Commission, uh, drafting some of the um, EU directives and eventually putting a, a CE stamp like the, like the ones that you find on every piece of electronics uh, on on the on the back of a, of a four and a half billion dollar railway um, mm. but I really didn't like working for the man working for um, big big corporations and so right. um, early in 2007 I think something like that my, my wife and I took off um, the landlord had said we're going to sell your house um, we'd uh, we got lots of up ideas of starting a business that we'd had over summer holidays <laughs> together. And, um, and so we, we decided to start the steel business. Um, we, we headed over to New Zealand for uh, a planning week, which was, or fortnight, which was absolutely brilliant. We knew that's what we wanted to do, but we realized, nah, New Zealand, lovely place, but wrong side of the world to be sort of getting involved <laughs> in, in heavy engineering. <laughs> Um, right. And so we we started it it off and it, it did pretty pretty well. We were we were selling a, a couple of million dollars a, a year fa fairly quickly, um, and that's when it all went wrong um, because we had the financial crisis, um, and pretty much all of our customers lost ninety ninety five percent of their orders. And if none of your customers can buy anything, if they're going bankrupt, um, there's not a lot that you can do. And, and that, that was really, really painful. Uh, we were, I don't know, maybe 20% of our competitors survived that shakeout. Uh, we, were, we were lucky. Well, lucky. Probably we were obsessively hardworking. My wife was back at the, <laughs> the table after two or three days after giving birth. No. Wow. 48 hours after giving birth, she was back on the phone trying to make sales so that we kept the, the, the house and we uh, and, and things could go on. And, and for the next five or six years, life kept on being like that. We'd have one economic shock after another. And, and we realized, I realized that simply 
the business model that we were using was not good enough. We could never make enough money. We could never do well enough. And right. so Doc, Doc Siva, um, who works at Proficio in, in KL, said to me, uh, Dennis, have you checked out this new thing called the business model canvas? And I saw it, I fell in love with it over the next six months. I, I think we went through 27 different iterations. Every week we sat down and said, okay, that didn't work, that didn't work, that didn't work. Okay, let's try a new business model. And we did that right. week in, week out, desperately trying to fail proof our business, desperately. And I mean, it got really close to the wire once it literally, uh, a few weeks closer to Christmas than it this, and we were sort of mm -hmm. having to choose up are we going to be able to buy baby milk to feed our small daughter or are we going to be able to buy enough rice for us to have a Christmas lunch? And you can imagine having just plain rice for Christmas lunch, even if you're not a Christian, isn't a great Christmas lunch. It was that tight at times. And so we kept on putting the effort in, trying to find the business model because cost cutting didn't work. Marketing didn't work. None of the normal rules of the game worked. And I, I then started off, um, after I'd done that, make a little bit of money uh, on the mm -hmm. side as the business started growing. Um, I, I started so doing business models on Fiverr, five dollars a piece, and then it was ten dollars a piece, and then it was fifty dollars a piece, and now I think it's about a thousand dollars a piece on, right. on on Fiverr for a business model. Uh, most of the time, I, I I don't say yes any any longer, so I'm not entirely sure about the price there, and it was constantly looking trying to understand what where you can find sources of advantage for a for a startup for a company mm -hmm. what's going to set you set you apart how can you survive when all of your competitors die and i've seen that time and time again in my own experience and frankly guys i like surviving it hurts. It's <laughs> brutal sometimes. You <laughs> scream with frustration. I mean, sometimes I put a pillow over my head when things have been really tough and just screamed into my pillow. Uh, it's been so frustrating. But mm. having had some failed businesses as well, I tell you, that pain's a lot less than failing. So that, that's where that's a little bit about my journey. And uh, I'll, I'll hand it back to you, Johan, for any questions. As deep as you want to dig, I'm an open mm -hmm. book. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing. Uh, hopefully, uh, if someone, if you get famous, really, really famous one day, and somebody needs uh, some extra juicy details, personal ones, then maybe they can refer to this, <laughs> right? But okay. I think before we dive right into uh, big business, medium business, and small business, I think there is something that we have to tackle before that. So it's become increasingly normal for people to have. Um, to, sorry, to maintain a job, a stable one, and then they do one or more things on the side, right? So do you think there is a point where something like a side hustle is considered a business? And if yes, what is that turning point? Um, I think it's uh, when you get the first cash in the door. Simple as that. <laughs> yeah. Point of a business, you're, you're, you're there to make money. When mm -hmm. it legally becomes a business sometimes it's taken me a year 18 months to actually go out and form a form a company some businesses honestly i've been bad i've never paid tax on um <laughs> because it never got to that 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 stage I, it was too difficult in the country i was living in at, 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 at the time um or because the additional admin load was was going to slow me down in the in the months of starting up but frankly when you got a side hustle and when you're making money that's a business the question then is how are you going to grow it yeah my mm. wife um used to buy handbags or some designer handbags off one site and then resell them on another site and she'd make uh in malaysian terms 25 or 30 ringgits a go it was nice for pocket money but the supply, the amount that she'd actually make on each handbag and the hassle, bah, it just wasn't worth turning it into a large enough business that was right. worth registering for formally. But when right. you're, somebody likes what you're buying, what you're selling, you've got a business. It's then okay. technical. Yeah. All right. All right. So then how would you define a big medium or a small business and in the case of what would you talk about side hustles would they automatically fall under 
a small business category or are they a separate thing on onto themselves what do you think so i i spend a lot of time looking at <laughs> statistical data about um, the number of companies. And so looking at something like um, truck drivers and, and people who are moving stuff around, just an yeah. example in, in the UK, um, you've got about 68,000 uh, limited companies, so formally mm -hmm. established by people um, with naught to four employees in right. who, who do trucking. You've got about 2,000 that have got 5 to 10. You've got about 500 that are 10 to 25. And you've got about 30 or 40 that have employed more than 500 people. Right. So okay. statistically, a big company is 500 people plus. The number of companies that employ less than a thousand people is 99.8 percent of all companies right. at least right yeah? right okay. um most companies are companies of one yeah i'm a company of one i like it that way i'm choosing that to be that way um because i, I don't desperately like managing people um <laughs> but that is that is the reality for, for most right. people you're going to be a company of one it's incredibly difficult to become a company of two or a company of three You've either got to be making a lot of money or you've got to be getting money from your savings and putting it into the business and hoping that you can be making enough money to, to pay for all these people before you run out of money. Um, and that's the hardest thing to go from a company of one to a company of two. Right. OK. OK, OK. Now that we have um, some numbers to put to the big, medium, and small, would you say that anybody, if they sell, something internationally does that automatically classify them as a medium scale business or does or is the ability to sell internationally irrelevant to how you would be classified i i think i think it's irrelevant nowadays maybe when i first started out mm -hmm. um in my first business in 2007 um we, we sold internationally from the word go. Actually, right. uh, we didn't sell anything until we'd actually, our head office was in the UK and we moved all of our operations into Kuala Lumpur. Yeah, we were, but under all, all, all UK standards, we were a micro business. We only ever employed, I think, right. about 10 or 15 people um, with that, that business. Uh, and they were all employed in Malaysia. So it's so easy. Um, selling on Fiverr, you go and sell on Fiverr. Boom. I, 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 I've sold to 72 countries on Fiverr. Yeah, it's so, so easy. It's got, so that's irrelevant. The world is small. The world is flat. Okay. Okay. So now let, let's get right into the meat of everything. Now that we've, we've set the context and we've hopefully clarified. So do you think businesses typically fail more due to internal or external factors it depends what size they are so mm -hmm. okay people people like me just starting off um and i guess a lot of the the audience here um and I, I'm, I'm going to be super blunt here. Frankly, when you start your first business, you're you're an idiot because you don't you don't know shit. You don't have enough experience. You've got to pick that experience up, and you pick that experience up by making mistakes. So your first two or three businesses, literally, you're making enough mistakes uh, to to learn how to do it properly. And a lot of those mistakes kill huge numbers that it means they just stop going out of business they don't make a big loss um and, and that generally is why most startups fail um however when if we think think about things like blockchain or, or crypto oops is that an awful lot of companies will start coming into a market at the same time in 1900 for example uh, people would think how many companies were making cars they think oh five or ten in the united states alone there were 1300 car manufacturers crazy. i mean absolutely crazy and and what happens is that for an industry to mature 
there's going to be a competition about amongst all the different business models that these companies right. are using. Yeah. So a lot of companies are going to execute well. A lot of companies are going to have brilliant leaders. A lot of companies are going to make a brilliant product. A lot of companies are going to get their marketing right. Right. Um, right. right. To break out of the pack and be one of the five or six out of the thousand who survive in any particular industry, you've got to have a lot of luck, an awful lot of luck, uh, and almost certainly you need to have a better, more efficient business model than anybody else. And there's a reason why industries consolidate down into two to three business models. Those are the ones that deliver the money with the least effort. But none of none of the entrepreneurs know that at the early stage when they're starting. Right. They're just trying stuff out. They're copying from another business, they're copying from another industry. And he's like, nah, the Uber for this, nah, didn't work in that one. The Canva for this, nah, the TikTok for that. Most of the time it doesn't work. Right. Okay. Okay. So then in in the context of big business, right? What are some issues that are unique to very large businesses? So it's entirely the op opposite. So at the when when an entrepreneurs go out and they find business models that work, mm -hmm. um, they 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 optimize, they polish those business models. Right. They they work them so that they get every little bit of penny and benefit out of them, and that's mm -hmm. how they grow into big companies. Um, Telecom Malaysia, Tanaga, Maxis have all gone and, and done that. Google and Amazon and Facebook are on the way to be doing to doing that. But after a time, you get um, what are called anomalies. Uh, they are things that didn't uh, made sense to do earlier in the life cycle. But right. later on there, the industry keeps on doing them because they because they always have not because that they continue to make sense. So for example, let's talk about uh, Tanaga National, very, very simple business model in, in some ways. Uh, it buys coal, ships it into Port Dixon, sends it to a, a power station, distributes it off the grid to um, your, your house, which then sort of powers your camera to, to send me your picture. Um, now, what happens if you go over to the East Coast, say to, to Quantan, and you look at all the solar fields going up down there. Why does Tanaga need to be buying petrol, uh, sort of coal or oil any longer, or running gas fired petrol stations? Yeah. If you think about all the solar panels going up on people's houses, why does it need a distribution network? And we know about these things, but they're all chipping away at Tanaga's business model. The Orang Asli now are often and, and remote remote camping are often powered by solar energy. So away, we're chipping and chipping away at the business model of the, the big companies. And it gets right. to a point where they start falling apart. Um, so for ex another example, um, when we go back uh, 30 or four, uh, four, no, not that far, 10 or 15 years, internet just came out. People started putting adverts on it. New Straits Time was still raking in the classified adverts. It was still making lots of money. But then everybody discovered Google and AdWords. Who's <laughs> ever thought of even putting something in there? And this is why they suddenly start to collapse because the raison d'etre of the old business model has gone. And the right. problem that big companies have is a lot of their foundations are being washed away and they're too arrogant, they're too confident, they're too blinkered to look down and realize how much trouble they're in. Right. Okay. So how then do they fix those problems? What what can they do about it, typically? Um, typically, um, they've got two choices. A, a, a big company has got two choices. And I'm just leaving aside for a, the moment sort of financial engineering and corporate right, engineering right. mergers and acquisitions. Right. right. Um, so they, they've got two choices. One, they, they try and do a transformation of the company, switching it to a, a new business model. A really good example of this is IBM. Mm. Uh, IBM's done this a number of times. IBM started off making calculators, then they switched <laughs> to making computers. Mm -hmm. Then they switched to, if I get this right, they switched to making software. 
then they switch to AI, then they switch to making cloud services, all totally different, um, but they were able to jump from being one company into another. Kodak famously tried it. They made digital, uh, they made cameras and films. They tried to make the jump into digital cameras, succeeded, they got a 40% market share, and, and, and then some horrible guy in a, in a, in a black uh, turtleneck came along and made uh, the iPhone, and then you didn't need a digital camera after all, boom, and, 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 their, and their business dis disappeared. So that's the first one, change the company. The other approach is to, to do what Google's doing, because it's not, it knows that AdWords is doomed sooner or later, is right. spend money on, on new ventures, on, on moonshot or loon shots as it calls them, new ventures <laughs> that it's hopes are going to grow up and be a much larger than the existing companies. So for example, if we think of a, a famous, uh, if second rate and pretty crap uh, computer manufacturer called mm -hmm. Apple Computers, in 2000, they were going nowhere fast. They were continually flirting with bankruptcy. Now, Steve Jobs could have gone and done what Michael Dell tried to do uh, or did and transfer them into a low cost, sort of customer orientated service, Bemoth. Yeah, but he says, no, I don't want to transform my company into doing that because I'm going to be mm -hmm. losing whatever uh, the, the ethos that he tried to create. So he said, I'm going to create new ventures and a couple of those, the, the, the iPhone, the App Store and all, all the other ones have created new businesses that are worth far more than the company that's still left in there somewhere that makes Apple computers, which is mm. almost irrelevant on the back app balance sheet nowadays. And that's a classic example of business model innovation, transforming a company by coming up with new businesses that exceed the old one. Right. Okay. 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 So that that is for when we're talking about really, really big business, right? So now what about medium scale business? Because th these can sometimes be difficult to classify, right? Because they likely have issues that are a bit separate from the big business, but also, they are different enough from small business. So what do you think is unique um, to, to medium scale businesses? I think they're, 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 more, they're far more similar to, to large companies in, in many okay. ways. I mean, the, the similarity is about 80, 90%. Right, yeah? okay. Um, they, I'll give you an example. I, I went to pitch um, business model innovation to a, a small company uh, owned by I mean, sort of Chinese owned engineering company just outside Kuala Lumpur, who right. made, let's say, petrol tankers. And I, and, and I said to them, okay, so this is what business model innovation is going to do. We, we're going to look at your business model, and we're going to understand who you are, we're going to look at opportunities and say, this is how your business model will transform. And, and then they said to me, but Dennis, we, we're going to be making petrol tankers on the same site in the same way at the end of it. And I'm going, <laughs> no. Um, and the when a business model is on the path down, right. there's, frankly, you can, the, the, about the only thing that you can do is niche down into a very protected niche that nobody else wants to chase. In, in the town I live in now, Loughborough, we have the largest bell maker in the world and they make great <laughs> big brass bells for churches. Right. The reason they're the largest bell maker in the world is no Chinese company has <laughs> thought that it's absolutely worth bothering making bells because nobody wants to make any bells any longer and they make about $2 million a year making bells. So you can go and niche down into that. I mean, it's exactly the same, like swan matches. People still make matches, but how many matches are used in the modern world nowadays now that cookers light automatically and you've got electric electric lighters and people have moved to vapes? It's left behind by history. So you can be left behind by history if you want to mm. hold on str strong enough. All right, that's, that's a perfectly reasonable approach. The other thing is to say, okay, what competencies have I got? How can I change and start right. looking? But what I see, most small businesses don't realize how bad it's going to get. Um, one, one, one of my friends uh, used to be very senior at Standard Chartered Bank, and he 
he told me of this conversation that he'd had with I think the chairman of the Malaysian Small Business Association um, and um, my friend will I'll call him Paul just for the, the space, of, space of the story he, he said to, to the Paul said to the chairman of the Malaysian SMEs Association I can't believe that you said that 30 percent of Malaysian SMEs are going to be bankrupt in the next five to ten years and the chairman of the SME organization said well that's all I could say because I'd have been voted out if I'd actually said it was going to be the 60 percent that our research says and this is how bad it's going to be I mean we're seeing it in the UK in every country just the way that AI machine learning IOT I mean I'm working with a startup at the moment that confidently mm -hmm. expects to be able to reduce the headcount in the supply chain industry by about 80 percent wow yeah and this wow. is what people are playing with yeah i know one of my friends uh dr sasha Ziskin, she's a radiologist uh with what is it 30 years experience in analyzing x-rays um but but now startups with very little experience in medical technology can their software can read the x-rays better than she can are there going to be any other radiologists following in her footsteps no we don't need them any longer so th there's this urgency of looking for new business models and how you're going to basically keep the business alive because the business isn't what you do the business is a, a holding company for the business models that you're using at the moment right okay very interesting i've never I've never quite heard it phrased like that okay okay so right with with the issues that that you've highlighted just there right what would you say are the most common things then that smes can do to prevent these kind of these kind of issues do they do they have to have a dedicated person that's always looking out at what's new on the market do they have to make sure that they have a reserve fund what what, what what are the steps that they need to be taking? I mean, ca cautious business management. Yeah, have some cash, have some talent, so that you're you're able to do stuff. Yeah, um, those those are starter stakes. Um, okay. I'm going to talk. I'm going to talk a little bit about art history for a minute. It is relevant. Sure. So bear, bear with me. So, in the 1880s, there was this Swedish artist called uh, Hil Hilda. I'm, I'm just going to type it in AF uh Klimt if not quite spelt right um and, and she was writing uh painting really boring pictures of cows eating food in Swedish farms and it's like yeah pretty but pretty boring frankly and then suddenly she saw something I don't know how and she starts drawing pictures of of squares and triangles really modernist art and she was the first European to be drawing modernist art about 20 or 30 years before anybody else and it's like why the bleep did she suddenly start seeing the world differently how did she see something that nobody else saw um in London last week uh startup grind had Sir Martin Sorrell come, come on in talking about advertising and they were saying bravo Sir Martin you've grown a a company to have revenue of 20 billion dollars bravo bravo mm. but nobody thought about the fact that a couple of Californians had looked at the advertising industry seen it totally for uh, totally differently and mm -hmm. created a company worth two trillion dollars called Google who saw advertising so totally differently that with no experience of the advertising industry they were able to create so much more value look at Elon Musk coming at the uh, the car industry changing it around changing the business models in there because he could see a different way of doing things and that has changed absolutely everything there so when we talk about small business owners frankly go out for a long walk have take psychedelic substances drink <laughs> get inspiration from lots of different places put it together in a different way and sort of get that perceptual shift so you're seeing the business on the industry very differently to anybody else 
Right. And that's your starting point for creating something of value because the core of it, if you've got the same business model as anybody else, you can't get better results than anybody else. If you've got the same business model as anybody else, you will go down with the industry or you will go up with the industry, but you won't do anything better up other than slogging away for 20 years, being a little bit better than everybody else and doing what Sir Martin Sorrow does. Traditional business, why? Different business, why? Look at things differently, have that perceptual shift, create and use that to create a new business model and bring in all the money, baby. <laughs> okay okay right so with with that in mind do you think that as as people are going out getting inspiration and and thinking about new ways in which they can innovate right do you think there are some um go-to innovations or some key innovations that everybody should be looking at like should they be looking at a completely tangential uh, industry education trying to perhaps pick up some of the successful techniques from gaming or maybe manufacturing trying to pick up some of the successful techniques from advertising so on do what what do you think it's going out it's plundering it's stealing um mm. don't worry about what your own industry is in i mean have some alarm set there sort of trip wires to just to right. make sure that your house isn't burning down but <laughs> frankly you're better off looking at different industries finding ideas from them and putting those two to, together in a different way and it's that playing with that that's i think far more important so traditionally over the last 50 60 years up to about 2000 2010 we're in a, mm -hmm. a time of normal business yeah that was when people were optimizing business models, making them better. Managers were rewarded for efficiency and effectiveness. Yeah, reduce costs, increase sales, maximize margin. Now, the world that we're in, managers are going to be rewarded for insight and creativity because too much stuff is happening too quickly. The rate of change is too fast for you to really get the benefits of effectiveness and efficiency. Yeah. Toyota production system out business model innovation in. Right. Okay. 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 Do you believe that there are some specific areas or industries that right now are in some dire need of, of innovation? It can be agriculture, finance, education. Do you think any? Um, I think pretty much. The way I look at it, if you've got little domain knowledge or experience in an industry, it's difficult to see the problems. But at mm -hmm. the same time, if you've got too much domain knowledge, you can't see the problems anyway because you've got too much, too much experience there. Certainly in, in logistics, which is a eight trillion dollars worth of, of, of goods and processes served, I know a lot about the problems, yeah and most of the technological solutions that are being put forward today aren't solving it the industry is creaking healthcare is creaking um uh age age care and, and dementia care is, is is creaking we're still using a business model for looking after old people and i've run an old people's chain of old people's homes in malaysia that is effectively the same as putting kids into kindergarten um 50 years ago you're putting the old people into a home that keeps them safe until they die, basically. And that's not a good way of looking after people. It's also hugely expensive because nobody wants to work in them. Education, similarly, why are we working off a 500-year-old model that was created to teach people classics and keep our sons of nobles out of trouble? I mean, it's like it doesn't teach people what they need. Lots of people know that, but we're unable to. Nobody's yet found the right business model to transform that. So there's a huge amount of opportunity here. And I, we spent a lot of this talk talking about how how stressful it is, how how to survive, how to fail proof your your business. But right now, uh, there have been two big business revolutions in the last 500 years. The first one, 
started off in the UK and fundamentally that in about 30 years, we went from having about 90% of people working on farms to having a huge number working in factories with all the social and economic changes that that involved. At the turn of the, the last century, at the turn of the 19th century, ah, 20th century, when we got electricity and steam coming out, boom, everything changed it all, all over again. And it took 30, 40 years for people like Nestle, Procter & Gamble, Unilever, Tesco, to Walmart to figure out what business models worked in this new right. age. We're going right. through that similar process now, but it is so big, you have no idea. And it's so this is the time when it's open for anybody who's worked in an industry, who's got a business, who can look back, see behind the surface, look at the skeletons, look at the patterns there and say, well, if I take this from here and this from here and put it together differently, am I hallucinating or is it something real? And then go out and start making little tests to see if it's real or if they're just about to walk in off, off an invisible bridge into a, a huge canyon. Yeah, we don't know. So you need to go out and explore because there are no answers. You are the people. It's just like David Livingston going off into the African jungle 150 years ago and it says there be dragons here there are dragons here we don't know but if you don't go out and go look somebody else is going to go and find the, the city of gold in the jungle not you and that's what i want people to go and do here right okay would you say that there are circumstances where a business wouldn't or shouldn't innovate are there any such circumstances Oh, lots, lots. I mean, if, if you're if you're making money, if you've got a government monopoly, um, it's a lot, lot better. If you if you're doing really well now, just crank the heart handle, churn out the money as quickly as you can, and then build up, up a store of value. Because where I can work, where what I do works, is right at the beginning of, of an industry's life cycle when there are the possibility of new business models and right at the end of the, the industry when it's starting to fall apart, when it's still standing, but the tree trunk is rotten. And if you start kicking it and kicking it and kicking it, it's gonna fall over. And then you're gonna feast because of all the honey inside the trunk. But when the trees are still solid and they're massive and thick, I mean, hitting it with an ax or kicking it isn't going to do you any good. And if you're that tree at that point, just churn out the money, stack it up and, and, and spend it as you want, or think one day I'm going to rock and start innovating in advance of that day. But you don't need to innovate at those points. Not business model innovation. Product innovation, yeah, sure. But everyone's got to do that just to stay in the game now. Right. Okay. Okay. Now, we we did mention that there's there's well, I think everybody has realized that with with the pandemic, especially everybody's seen how things have changed. Right. So, mm -hmm. one of the the major things that has been happening is a lot of people are resigning from previous work or work structures are shifting. Right. And and mm -hmm. people that are, are now hiring globally, like teams are no longer confined to just being sourced from the same country. Right. So with with businesses becoming much more diverse, hopefully a bit more equitable and maybe <laughs> inclusive, do you think businesses that are that have these traits are less likely to fail, or do you think that it it doesn't that being being diverse, equitable, and inclusive doesn't affect their failure rate? I think. There are some businesses that are going to work incredibly well that are not diverse, are totally unfair and are totally inequitable. Yeah, it's, it's better for them. I, I, I think so. Some types of farming, um, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So it's not as simple as diverse or, 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 or not diverse. But right, right. Generally, if you want innovative companies, I think it, it makes a lot more sense to be di di diverse. And I think um, I certainly see 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 it in in, in Malaysia. And yeah, I'm because I don't live live in Malaysia any, any any longer. I'm quite happy to say this, but too many companies in Malaysia are monoethnic. Yeah, that mm. significantly impacts uh, their competitiveness. 
uh, their understanding of of the market and what it is possible to uh, to sell how we have how to make them more and more customer centric. So that holds them back. So I, I certainly think that if you want to be coming up with insights, challenging the, the leaders of companies, challenging the way that you're looking at the world is incredibly important. How you do that, it, there's a lot of different, different ways, but it's opening up people's eyes. Okay, okay. What role do you think um, education plays in in make, in helping reduce the failure rate of businesses? Because this is education is one of the the big topics that we are covering for global entrepreneurship. So, what role do you think it plays? I think it makes it harder to innovate. It may, and and that's because, and I, I see this. I, and I think this is one of the reasons why Western education is different to uh, Asian education is because so much is focused on the exams and getting the right answers. We're training people to pass exams and people will do things so that they get the right answers so that they um, so that they win. But in the age that we're going into, there are no right answers. Nobody knows what the right answer is. So the only way that you can win is by failing lots and lots of times. So think about it this way, that if you wanted to get a, an A at a, 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 a SKM or uh, for the, the senior level in, in Malaysia, the, the uh, school leavers, or oh, say you want to get SPF. a first class degree. SPA, yeah. If you wanted to get a first class degree, imagine if the teacher said, well, we expect you to put in at least 10 essays where you get zero marks because you've got everything so totally wrong because you've been pushing the boundaries of your thought so much. Yeah, that would that would be such an anathema to the student body, to the academic body, to so much of society but that is the way that people have to go in this age we have to learn how to fail fast because until we fail fast we can't succeed hmm. okay. all right but then we we have a lot of safety nets now especially since the start of COVID. there have been a lot of stimulus and a lot of assistance from governments and policy makers so what then is the role of governments and policy makers in in uh, helping reduce of uh, failure rates of businesses? Um, no, I think government should in help increase the failure rates of businesses. I should make it. <laughs> no, it's, it's counterintuitive, but it, but, it, but it makes sense because what we want is more people going out and trying an idea. It might be crazy, it might not work, but if it does, yet yeah, we're going to benefit so much more than if we never tried at all. I mean, I spent eight mm. months this year living in in the UAE, uh, which is a, oh, too hot. Uh, and after <laughs> I never thought I'd say that. Um, but 83% of Emirati citizens work for the government because it's safe. They're not prepared to risk that nice safe salary and do something for themselves. 83% is appalling what we want those people to do and in malaysia and in the uk every country is the same in this respect we want people to be going out and starting businesses new types of businesses different businesses from what people ever have ever tried before and that is going to be creating the the vast amount of wealth that this revolution the industrial revolution is going to create that's what we did or people did at the start of the 20th century that's what people did at the start of the 18th and 19th centuries at previous revolutions mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. government need to get people out there give them the confidence yes you can go out you can start a bankrupt uh, business you can go bankrupt and then we'll help you get back on your feet and start it again your bankruptcy is not going to be a stigma that's going to make you unmarriageable a sort of persona non grata and, and all the rest of that shit yeah we want people who go out and are explorers and a try yeah i have a big uh stigma or i feel i've got a big stigma 
I, I, I've had at least seven or eight businesses fail totally miserably. And I don't feel like boasting about them. I don't feel like going, say, oh, I, I've gone bankrupt seven times. I failed more times than you can count because I still feel the stigma of my upbringing. And that slows me down from going out and starting more businesses. And anything that's stopping people, slowing people down from seeing what they can create, seeing what they can grow, seeing what they can nurture is hurting all of us. All right. Okay. Okay. We have a couple of questions in the Q&A. Before we jump right into those, I, we just have one more just on very on top. So pandemic has seen a lot of businesses get turned upside down. What are some of, uh, what are some of the incidences or innovations that have stood out to you since the start of the pandemic until now? Things that you saw and you're like, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to blow my own trumpet a little bit. No, actually, I'm, I'm going to blow a friend, friend, friend's trumpet. So I, I, I got a, a friend in, in, in Singapore called um, Sean Kwan. Uh, he has this idea that everybody ought to um, eat vegan food um, because it's better, better, better for you. And so his startup, saverablife.com, has been making hugely delicious vegan meals. Um, uh, and delivering them to KLites um, for, for the last two, two or three years. Um, before the pandemic started, we were, we were doing quite well. Sales were going up 20, 30% a, a, a week. Uh, as, as we wow. went out, we gave people a, a health check um, and said, oh, your blood sugar is too, too high. You're going to get diabetes unless you do something about it. Why don't you have some of our vegan meals? Ta-da! Surprise. But, because he's a medical doctor, totally legit, no, no, no hard sales in it at all. So this all came to a sort of stop when the government said there's a lockdown. Yeah, how do you go out and you get new customers? And so we were sitting there, and when I'm working with a business to to help them solve uh, these kinds of problems, yeah, we got no money coming in, we got no meals going out, we we were doomed. Um, I go back and I, I do ask some really, really stupid questions. Uh, and I said to Sean, um, what happens if we give all the food away for free? <laughs> and we both laughed and we thought, what a stupid I idea. But then very quickly, we figured out a, a, a new business model. And I, I think that we, we, get, we gave it all away for free. Uh, mm -hmm. We managed to persuade people to give us something like 500,000 ringgits to do so. Or we wow. expanded to 40 or 50 staff. And, we, and, we, and we, was, we grew the business by about 60 times very, very quickly. Um, and then that obviously didn't last. But we then sort of then went down into a very different type of business afterwards <laughs> because we got that experience and confidence and, and, and scale. So the point of that story though, I'm, I am actually really proud of the 60, 60 X growth is that when you, you look at the business and you get out of, this is the way that the business has to work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You start thinking about it from a very different perspective. You're then able to see opportunities that other people cannot. Yeah. And it's those different opportunities which you can then start analyzing. If you're, I mean, loads of people have done a business degree. Loads of people have done a, a, an, a, an MBA. Uh, mm -hmm. Pretty much everybody in business after a while has read a lot of the business strategy books. And, and so we all sit down with the business problem and we all apply the same <laughs> rules and techniques. And, and lo and behold, we all start building oil rigs or new copper mines at the same time. And when they come on stream, there's a glut in the market and we make a fraction of the money that we think we're going to make because like, we're all using the same par paradigms and models. This is what continually happens. So my argument is, is like for all these people suffering by the pandemic, yeah, if you've got a business suffering by the pandemic, all your competitors are going to be suffering in the same way. And you're going to, all going to be applying logic in a similar way. And so you're all going to come up with a similar set of answers. <laughs> and you're not going to be any better off, are you? 
So you've got to twist your thinking so that you see the world a different way. Yeah. And I don't have a, a gold plated set of all the answers like Moses coming down from the from the mountains and say, <laughs> these are the answers. You you gotta figure them out for yourself. Other, otherwise I wouldn't be talking here. I, I, I'd be sitting in my sort of thirty billion dollar gold plated yacht. Of course. Um, of course. And I would I wouldn't need to. <laughs> this is what you've got to think of. And it's probably the hardest thing that anybody ever does. How do you see something that nobody else has ever seen before? How do you take those really stupid, crazy ideas that you flash into your mind one day and, and just explore them, tweeze them apart, understand them, explode them, and then condense and crystallize them into um, something that you can go out and test and then see if it can work? And that's the, the big challenge, I think, that, that faces all of you today. All right. All right. Fantastic. I think with that, we can jump right into the Q&A. <laughs> now, our first question in the Q&A actually came pretty early. It came in like 30 minutes ago. Okay, It's from Tristan. He said, good evening. And he would like your piece of advice to a young aspiring businessman. If you could say one thing, what would it be? I'm going to say, get lots of sleep, spend a lot of time on self-love and self-care, and don't work too hard. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, I can expand on that, but, but basically, if you're burnt out, you make crap decisions. The worse decisions you make, the more screwed you are. Um, <laughs> and, I mean, I've just got that 10,000 hours of meditation la later. It's like, <laughs> you're, you're a lot more chilled. What's, losing that customer doesn't matter in the in the greater scheme of things. Yeah, that was 90% of my income that's just gone like that. Okay, but I don't panic. It's like, okay, I need to do something about this. Get back. And it's not a stress panic. It's like, okay, what are we going to do? And you start building up again. You become more resilient and resilient is absolutely critical for every entrepreneur. Okay, okay, well, Tristan, I hope uh, that helps. <laughs> and now our next question comes from Nigel. He would like to know, what are some of the things that businesses should be aware of when there is a shift in the market, such as when the iPhone changed the whole mobile phone industry? It's I think you want to come pretty quickly to a judgment. Is this for now or is it forever? I think and you answer for you... both. Okay. So, um, well, that, that's the decision he's got to ask. That's the, that's the, you've got to come to that. And you need to probably come to that within weeks or months rather than years. And then you probably need to start betting your company on what with one of those choices and and you go and you go down that way um and i don't think it, it matters too much which way you you go and i'm, I'm mm. trying to abstract lots of information into this answer but having the confidence yeah you if you say nothing's going to change then maybe you do a little bit of hedging but you then focus on maximizing your business model for the environment that you're, you're in now or you change focus your efforts as a, as a leader on maximizing or optimizing your business model for the world that you start seeing coming ahead right yeah. and they're two very different management skill sets and from what I, i've seen it's fairly challenging for managers to be able to do both well i was talking to the CEO of an Indonesian airline. Uh, there aren't that many, so you might be able to figure it out. Um, <laughs> the, the the other day, and he he was totally focused on solving his immediate problems right now. Yeah, there wasn't isn't enough space to be going out and innovating, exploring right 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 at the moment. And this is the reality of what happens when when Mark market shift so by thinking fairly early on 
about what's likely to happen, how bad it's going to be, and generally it's going to be worse than you expect. We've got enough data from enough industries. Look at newspapers, look at look at TV, look at oil and gas, look at General Electric, for example. It's worse than any of them ever expected. Making that decision early on, am I going to be focusing on the innovation or the operations? Yeah, if you're going to focus on the innovation, get some dude who's good at operations to be your COO and number two, and he's looking after the house. Yeah, and then you focus on creating the new company that's going to survive. Right, right. Okay, okay. So another question we have. This one um, I think might need a bit of clarification from the question uh, from the person who posed the question, but I, I, I think I've got the gist of it. Uh, Haliana is asking, how would you convince conservative companies like SMEs in Malaysia to adopt this method? I think the method she was referring to at the time was um, uh, making sure you consistently innovate and be, be critical about your current state. Uh, Haliana, please feel free to clarify in chat. I'll just pause for a moment. Um, well, actually, I'm going to jump in, and then I'll, if if Aliana sort of comments further, I'll I'll I'll, I'll do it. Um, so yeah. a, cu a couple of things. I use I use the business model canvas uh, an awful lot. It's it's mm -hmm. a useful tool. It's not the be all and end all, but one very good thing that I I do when I'm, I'm sitting down with with SMEs mm -hmm. is to get them to say, don't do your own business model canvas, but I want you to do your competitors. And we sit down, we do one competitor, then the next competitor, then the next competitor. Interesting. And a lot of the time, there's a bit of a, oh, halfway through, when they see that all of their competitors, or a lot of the competitors, have got exactly the same business model as them. And they think, well, how am I going to get ahead of them? If we're all doing exactly the same thing in the same way and it's that awakening and then they're starting to see quite often that oh he does it like that does he so if i do that they're starting to see innovative ways of disrupting their competitors business models and that starts thawing um thawing things out um the other other way, and, and this is less effective, but it does work reasonably well with accountants and, and logisticians. I did some work for, oh, I can't, it, it was one of the plant, plantation companies. And I sat back and I, I looked at their, their dipping, oh, they started off as a rubber, then moved into palm. Um, and I looked at their, their management or, or the published accounts for, I think it was about 20, 20 years and, and looked at looked at the key ratios. And it was clear it was a bit of a downward trend. And then I looked at other palm oil companies and it was a downward trend. And if, they, if you don't own land near a big city, it's, it's a downward um, trend for, for lots of reasons. And you're, you're then usually fairly able to clearly to say, well, this industry isn't working. What are the fundamental problems in the industry? And then starting to think, okay, how do we look at those differently? And, and they say, well, we tried this, we tried this, we tried this, we tried this. And I've had engineering managers say that to me and say, okay, that's great. So we don't have to waste our time on the obvious shit. Okay, let's start thinking about stuff that isn't obvious. Yeah. And so we're not, we're not going to do what Sir Martin Sorrell did. Yeah, we've got lots of people doing that, the obvious stuff. Let's start looking at palm oil or, or rubber or, or or flower trading or whatever it is, sugar trading, and do things differently because the other stuff doesn't work. Okay, okay, okay. Next question is from Hilmi. When starting up a business, does it matter if you're going into a saturated market? For example, opening a cafe, or is it best to keep things unique and innovative from other businesses? All right. Um, I will start from the, the point of the business model, right? Your business model has got to do two things. Yeah. It's got to make your value proposition a lot more effective. So if you are opening a cafe, for example, um, I say it's a mamak, um, it's got to make it a lot more attractive for people to come and sit in your mamak than to go to somebody else's mamak. 
Yeah. So what is it about your business model that differentiates you from all the other other Mamax out there? Yeah. So that's the first thing. Yeah. To make it better, to be the rocket power to, to get to get you growing fast. The second thing is what's going to be the hammer in your business model that screws all the other Mamax, all the other food courts around you and makes people want to come to you. Um, let me give you an example from from Tesla. Um, Tesla, um, cool cars, big factory, um, wicked batteries, all automated updates, all that crap. That's not what's really clever about the Tesla business model. What's really clever is that they're selling direct to the public. And that's not rocket science. But all the other car manufacturers have, have spent 100 years, certainly in Western Europe and North America, building these systems where they sell the cars to distributors, distributors then sell them on to consumers and the distributors have got a, a service center attached. Uh, so by selling them to direct to consumers, yeah, um, Tesla is forcing the car manufacturers to make a choice. Do we abandon this whole distribution network we spent 100 years building or do we leave the marketplace open to, to Tesla? And, and what they're doing is, in, in certainly in Central Europe, I was talking to somebody the other day, um, their margins have been cut by 80% by Volkswagen. Yeah, Volkswagen has just gone and destroyed all these distributors because Tesla has given to Volkswagen an incredibly difficult choice and is forcing Volkswagen to ruin its existing business model. Right. And that's what you need to be able to articulate in your business model. Maybe I think this is what's going to happen. Then go out and test and try it. But if you go into a cafe market with a bunch of other cafes and you're doing exactly the same thing as all the other cafes, it's like, well, there's a reason why most cafes are, um, don't survive more than three years. OK, OK. Well, I think we are almost right on time for, for, for our event. And uh, usually, Dennis, when we, when we wrap up, we like to uh, end it with some, some rapid fire questions just to change, change things. Up. But, but before, before, before we do that, in case um, anybody has to jump off of the, of the session very, very quickly, let's say they've had so much fun, they thought, man, this was insightful. I need to get me more. Dennis, how do they reach you? How do they connect with you? Lay it on us. Okay, so if you hit me on LinkedIn, um, that's the easiest thing. Let me just copy this uh, and paste it into the What's It. You, you can connect with me on on LinkedIn, or you can sign up to my new newsletter. Um, sometimes it's daily, sometimes it isn't. Sometimes it's it's super interesting and it's going to change the way that you see the world. I'm told. Uh, other times people just <laughs> don't read it at all on eyes. But that's the whole point experiment experiment keep on exploring fail fast see what works move on right okay with that ladies and gentlemen let's enter our rapid fire session to close things off so dennis this will be very very easy all right i'm gonna say a couple of statements just to start and the first part we're just gonna get you to agree or disagree all right so agree or disagree cryptocurrency will eventually lead to the creation of a new universal currency. False. Okay. Automation will allow for more meaningful use of time and human capabilities. True. Okay. The potential benefits of AI outweigh the risks. True. The nine to five 40 hour work week is outdated. True. Billionaires are bad for the world. False. Okay. Now, a bit more personal. Would you rather invest in health or education? Hell? Did you say hell or health? Health, health, not health. <laughs> health. Okay. <laughs> okay. A, a, a education, because the people who do that will then increase my health in the longer term. Okay. Would you rather have, have a self-cooking kitchen or a self-stocking fridge? 
a kitchen that cooks itself isn't good, so I'd have a full fridge. <laughs> okay. Last oh, one. Yeah. Would you rather do space travel or time travel for a futuristic holiday? Oh, time travel. I could go back to Malaysia before there were any people. And <laughs> the, 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 the forest is like, no, that's a no-brainer. I mean, who wants to go out into the expanse when this, this world was so wonderful before we, we trashed it? Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for your candor and your honesty. Ladies and gentlemen, that is all we have for this evening. We hope you've had a great time. Remember, if you are interested in connecting with Dennis, feel free to find him on LinkedIn at Dennis Oakley. All right, with that, everybody, let's say goodbye for now. Thank you, everybody. Great to have you here and brilliant questions. Really appreciated them.